All right, everybody, welcome to the show today. I have an incredibly special guest to me. Sally Brinker, my mother, is on the podcast today. This is all part of the series that I'm doing. I started with my dad. You guys all listened to it, hopefully, a couple weeks ago. Now we're on to my mother, who's an incredibly important important figure in my life. And um, welcome, Mom. Hello. Thank you. She She's sitting in front of... Uh, antiques which is very my mom she's into old things like if you're watching if you're watching the video she's i don't know what's back there but a bunch of old dishes and like an old cabinet and this says a lot of i know this you says want a lot about my childhood <laughs> yeah i did not get the antique bug but i grew up around uh an antiquer um so we are <clears throat> we're going to talk about all things life mom and okay I don't know. Did you listen? Did you listen to the conversation I had with with dad? I didn't listen to the whole thing. I didn't want to. He didn't want me to because he said it might be better if you don't know what I said. And so I took his advice. (laughs) That makes it sound like that makes it sound like he said something bad about you, which he didn't. No, he just didn't want me. I don't know. He didn't want me to be influenced by stories he told or something. Mm, So I mm. I did listen to a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the rundown of what we did with him because we're going to kind of go through the same process with you. And I didn't, just so everybody knows, I did not give her any information prior to this about what we're going to talk about. But I told her not yeah. to worry about it. We'll we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, so I want to start with, you know, I, I love digging digging into your his, your family's history because I think it's really interesting, sort of how you got to you know, your, your adult portion of your life, how you met dad, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I want to talk a lot about our childhood <clears throat> mm-hmm. and, um, all the way to present day with grandbabies and all that stuff. So I think okay. people take, excuse me, people, my listeners seem to find value. Like they can, they can relate to a lot of the things I talked about with dad mm-hmm. and they I've gotten a lot of great feedback on the episode. So let's start from the beginning. So, okay. You, you, you obviously, um, your family came from Europe, just like the rest of us, but, uh, mostly the Nordic countries, if I, if yes. right via right. the, the genetics that we've done. So talk yes. a little bit about that. And then I want to start, I want to start with your dad, because I think your dad is an important part of your story. Yes. Well, very European. Um, surprisingly, and I only found this out recently, I'm very Scottish. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? I knew I was Swedish and Danish and English, but I had no idea about the Scottish part. Just found that out recently on Ancestry. So that's fun. I've always been fascinated by it. And Rachel and I, um, daughter-in-law, are going to go to Scotland in June. So completely coincidental actually so um, what's your present what's what's your percentage of scottish 44 oh wow i didn't get a lot of that i what was my i think mine was like 10 percent. you got a lot of dads germ germany and and things like that he's german and swiss um british and english yeah and he does have some scandinavian also so you're getting that from both sides um, yeah, but so, yeah, t- so uh, obviously, you know, long story short, your family comes over from Europe on your dad. Talk about your dad's side a little bit first. Well, they, they live, they came in from Canada and they lived in Ontario for a long, long time. Um, and then they moved down into the, the, peninsula in Michigan and then down into Michigan and then they came out west so in the like in the 1920s they came to Oregon but he was raised in Michigan and his parents uh were raised in Michigan but then both sides came from Canada but yeah. i mean it and gets- why did he, why did they come to Oregon um, he, my grandfather was a doctor and he got a job, um, being the, 
the head guy at Oregon State University. So he ran the um, student health service for 50 years in Corvallis. Oh, wow. I See, I learned things on these podcasts too. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. And my grandma was a teacher, but I don't think she graduated as a teacher, but I don't think she taught. I think she mm. had babies. So. Okay. Um, okay. So your dad's, your dad's born. We're going to fast forward quite a bit here because I I want to get to, I want to get to the, the, the meat sort of when you come into the picture and forward. Yeah. He was raised in Corvallis, um, had a sister, um, and they had a pretty idyllic life. I think they would spend the summers camping at Subtle Lake in a, in a tent And my dad and aunt would roam around the lake in canoes and homemade rafts. And um, my grandfather would come back and forth when he could. And in those days, it was a pretty daunting drive over the mountain. Um, But that was their fun summers. And then they were a real horse family, so they had horses. My dad was a very very good horseman. And then as he got older, he um, did the warm-ups for the horses up at the horse races in Portland. He was like warmed up the horses before the races. He was a jumper. They used to do hikes, uh, horseback rides and camping up in the Wallala Mountains and things like that. It was super important to him. And he was extremely close to his mother. Um, I don't know much about the relationship with my grandfather, but I know he was really close with my grandmother and sister. And, and he, when did he decide to go into the military? Um, or I mean, uh, into the, 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 he was I guess, in civil service. Not, yeah. in civil services. When did that military. occur? He was like 18. And the war was Mm -hmm. brewing in Europe. America hadn't joined yet. And so he joined the civil service with his best friend and they were sent to Honolulu. And two days after he got there or three days, Pearl Harbor was bombed and he was there. He was on the docks. And so take us through that story. Via, via, tell us about the letters he sent from there. Tell us about his experience there. I think it's an incredible story. Yeah, he um, actually had woken up that morning, written a letter to his mother, and was on the way to mail it when he heard the the bombers. And so he and his buddies somehow got down there. They were. I think they were working on, his job was working on the ships. So they all went down there while it's being bombed. um, He saw, I mean, he was dodging them as they were coming in. He saw buddies get killed. Um, And then when it was over, then he was in charge of, in charge of, not in charge, but he, he and his crew went down into the ships and were bringing people out. And so he uh, was very active in the whole days, the day of and the days following. It was, you know, all consuming. And he was just this kid, just maybe turned 19 on the ship on the way over there, I think. And so um, I think obviously it really changed his whole life. I think he suffered from PTSD very badly and it sort of, you know, set the stage for the rest of his life. So he was on the way to the post office. He he was on the way to the post office to mail a letter when that happened. Yes. Is that the letter that you, is that, is that the letter that you've shown me before? Do we have that letter that, the letter that he was going uh, I to send. I have that letter. 
I have that letter. And then I also okay. have the letter that he wrote either that night or the next night. They had no light. He was doing it by cigarette light. He wrote his mom another letter that said, I'm okay. I'm okay. Could you, do, you do you have that right there, mom? Do you have the letter? I don't have it right here. I would have to get it. It's Oh, okay. Put away, I might post it. I, I might. Okay. Yeah, I might post it. I, th I I think it's a really, really powerful letter to read. I mean, this literally is like, you know, the a, a direct message from the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, which yes. obviously was awful. And I have, you know, I have a binder of that many letters that he wrote to his mother during the whole thing. He lived in Hawaii for, I don't know, four years or something. And then he joined mm -hmm. the Navy and he was, mm -hmm. you know, went to Guam, I think, or something like that. But mm -hmm. his letters are a diary of what he was going through and his friends and how they entertained themselves and the blackouts and helping his neighbors. And there it's, it's unbelievable. The record that he left. It's, it's one of my most prized wow. possessions. The binder of letters. Wow. So this is and when he was 19. When, when did he meet your mother? They were childhood friends. My mom and my aunt were best friends. And so she always knew my dad, but he was five years older. Oh. So when she was like, you know, 10, he was 15 and kind of becoming a young man. She was still a kid. And so then right. he went off to Hawaii and he grew up. Meanwhile, my mom was growing up. And when he came home on leave, they met, and I mean, met again and I think she had always been crazy about him. And so then but they how started. Old, how old was he at that point? He was probably, I think they were 25. He was like 25 or 26 when they got so married. So this is like uh, 1947? They got married in 45, I think. Oh, okay. I, so this I is... remember, but she was young. She was like 19 or 20. And what, what was her story? Where, what was she doing at that point? Well, she, um, uh, my grandfather was a true entrepreneur. He was an inventor. Um, he was super brilliant. Um, he had always been Good, Say the things him. he invented. Well, he invented an upright freezer. It was the first upright freezer of its kind. He invented particle. pretty important, pretty important to my, pretty important to my crowd, upright freezers. Yeah, it was a Chapman freezer. Um, it was all about getting patents during that time mm -hmm. with, you know, the industrialization of the United States. People were just cranking out ideas like crazy. Right. And so it was all about if you get the patent first. So it was like a, mm -hmm. a war of, of that. He invented a double propellered helicopter, which he did not act fast enough to get the patent on. Uh, the wheels mm. to it were in the attic my whole childhood. We we knew all really? about this. Yeah. I have pictures of him wow. and his brother <laughs> testing this thing out. Um, particle board. Um, he used to bring home the shavings. He had a, a mill. He would bring home shavings and experiment with making particle board. So he would put different kinds of glues and solvents and all this stuff and then bake them in the oven. So I can remember the smell of that. It's like part of my childhood. He was always experimenting and doing wow. these quack, quacky things. And then ultimately uh, he had uh, chop wood was what it was called. And he had mills in Flomouth, but he also had one in Italy. He had one in, uh, I 
think Japan, don't quote me on that, but they would travel the world and he would help these people. I don't know if he owned those mills or if he was a consultant or if I, I don't know exactly the business end of it, but he was afraid to fly. I don't think he ever flew. And so everywhere they went, they had to go by train and ship. And so, you know, that was kind of cool. Wow. He invented a helicopter, hey. but he wouldn't fly. That's crazy. So these inventions, did he, like, the business side of it, did he sell these for lots of money? Did he, like, did he just he invent them and move on and not? He was, he was a, like, a brainiac. He wasn't a businessman. He did well. I mean, they were very wealthy by Corvallis, where I grew up, by the standards of Corvallis, pretty wealthy. But I don't think that he excelled in the business world. That's probably yeah. not a fair statement. But he had many patents um, that, you know, rolled in. He invented a casket out of his wood that he believed was better than using, you know, all this other stuff. Um, that's great. I didn't stuff. know that. That's crazy. Yeah. And he that's, had that's insane. And, and I'm sure the business partners were taking care of the business end of it while he was just, and he got an honorary, uh, I don't know if it was a doctorate from Oregon state in the field of engineering because he was mm. such a forward thinker. You know, he was kind of ahead of his time. He was, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, that yeah, that's, I, I think, I think, I think I've read somewhere, you would know this somewhere I found, all right, you have a letter or, or a, uh, excuse me, a, uh, uh, what speech. do you call it? It was like the, t yeah, it was the text from a speech he gave at Oregon state. Yes. Correct. To the engineering and, class. And I want to read it again because I remember being so impressed with the way he spoke. Yes. And I just feel like I could have hung out with him and like got along with him so great. Just just yeah. entrepreneurial in in the engineering sense, like always yes. trying to improve things, but also really well spoken. Um I'd love to have him on my podcast. <laughs> hey, I'm the best you're gonna do. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, he <Okay>. was <laughs> In the speech that you're referring to, it was very interesting because so much of it is applicable to today. He was mm -hmm. thinking in the future. So that was super interesting. But he didn't. Yeah, I want to read that again. You're going you're gonna to you're gonna have to scan that for me and get it to me, too, because I want to read okay. that. For sure. He didn't come into money until my mom was graduating from high school. So she mm -hmm. did not grow up with money. They they had it after she, she was sort of gone. So my mm -hmm. mom was still a depression baby. She was still, you know, conservative with money. And right. um, so that was a whole thing. But, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so your, your mom and dad get married. Yeah. Um, and at what point are you born? Well, Uncle Dan was born first, and then you were yes. born when? Five years later, almost five and a half years later. So there was. So at a, that point, your dad is tw 30 years old? Probably 30 ish, yes. Okay. 31, All right. Maybe. So you're born. What was your childhood like? Like, obviously, your dad was like pretty adventurous guy, had been abroad, lived in Hawaii, he, and now he, he here he is a, back in yeah. Corvallis. Being domestic, I think it was hard mm -hmm. for him. He was kind of a free spirit. He was a musician. He loved jazz. He loved, he played the piano. He played the drums. Um, he hung out with musicians, you know, kind of the cool cat. Yeah, we crowd. have a picture of him somewhere uh, playing a ukulele on his doorstep in Honolulu, he, which I yes. love that picture. Yeah. 
He loved playing the ukulele. Um, he played bongo drums. I mean, he he loved wow. music. Loved music. Yeah. I always and, wondered where I got my got my like uh I I love the like I love the mountains and I love all the things I do there and the hunting and all that stuff obviously. Mm -hmm. But I I have a real love for the tropics, especially Hawaii that's just mm -hmm. been ingrained in me. Um yeah. and part of it's from, you know, we were blessed as kids to go there a few times yes. with you guys because of you guys. Yep. But I think also it comes from this uh sense of just knowing that my grandfather found a very special place there and lived there through one of the most consequential events in United yes. States history. That's and right. he was a musician, which I am too. Outdoor class is the new source of premium outdoor education from trusted and knowledgeable experts for hunters committed to improving their skills. Outdoor class is the only subscription based e-learning platform that provides unlimited access to video lessons from the world's most respected experts. Learn from industry leaders like Corey Jacobson, Randy Newberg, Remy Warren, and other experts across all the topics that affect you as a hunter. Make sure to follow Outdoor Class Official on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and take your game to the next level by going to OutdoorClass.com. You can use code ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off. That is ALTITUDE at checkout for 20% off at outdoorclass.com <laughs> which there isn't a lot of that in our family right he's one of the only ones um like yes. i think so, you're right anyways i i like to think that's kind of like this uh unconscious vibe i get as to why i have that direct connection there and with music maybe i think so too he was a frustrated artist oh and he was an artist too um, mm. I think that was the life he wanted to live, but he found himself in a, you know, a house with a white picket fence and a very want to stay at home mom. She wasn't adventurous. She liked her little space mm -hmm. on, you know, her little, you know, paradise. And I think that it was hard for him to to live that way. So right. I always had a sense that he never really found what his true, he loved us. I don't mean that, but I think it was hard to fit into this mold, this domesticated mm -hmm. role like that. So right. um, a lot of stuff. So, so he, you, you, you grew up in Corvallis and he ended up unfortunately passing away when you were nine. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happened? He, um, <clears throat> it was just kind of a crazy story. He had an abscess tooth and he went to, you know, they gave him antibiotics for it. It was a high powered new antibiotic that was brand new on the market. And he wanted to get back to work. He was a salesman for my grandfather's company wanted to get back to work. And so they gave him this new drug and the infection went away. But a month or so later, he started getting sick and they, they didn't put the two things together at the time. Um, because that drug was so new. I don't think they really knew all the side effects. Um, and so, uh, I think that he figured out he was getting sick in November and then he died in February. Like what, what, yeah. what do you mean getting sick? What, what did he feel he, like? What, the what drug his caused his bone marrow to quit working. So he developed aplastic anemia. And at that time it was totally incurable. They had no way to do it. Now they do bone uh, marrow transplants. You know, he might've had a chance, mm -hmm. but they didn't know mm -hmm. what he had. They were, they mm -hmm. had no idea. They had him in isolation because they didn't know if it was contagious. They had no idea. So. And they, um, and they confirmed that it was because of this medication eventually? Yes. Yes. He's like on the books. He He's like one of why the didn't, first. Why didn't your family, why didn't your family sue the pharmaceutical company? Well, that was a topic, but my mom said, Nothing is going to bring him back. 
and she didn't want to it's so so my mom and me actually she didn't want to make trouble <laughs> didn't want to so, didn't want to ruffle feathers didn't want to have confrontation you know, <laughs> and she was so devastated by everything i just don't think that she could think about it to be honest so mm. she wa um, she wanted to move past it i guess i i don't really know but people i remember people later saying you know your mom could have sued them the pharmaceutical oh yeah absolutely the dentist i don't know she did not want to get the dentist mm -hmm. in trouble because he didn't know so right god that's so yeah that's so and tragic. she was only 35 my mom was only 35 so that was you know Jeez. that was rough that was rough my goodness so yeah. Your, your childhood was, you know, if you had to sum it up. In... It was great until it wasn't great. That's, that's how I would put it. Cause that was, and uh, you know, th that was a turning point. And mm -hmm. what, what went sour after that, other than just the tragedy of losing somebody? Well, you know, my mom was only 35. She had no skills outside the home. She had to get a job. Um, she was very, and legitimately so, very preoccupied with surviving and dealing with grief and putting food on our table. My brother was already 15, so he was, not to say it was easy on him, I don't mean it like that, but he was kind of on his own anyway. You know, he was independent. I was still very mm -hmm. dependent. <clears throat> and so I think that the adults were doing adult things and dealing with the new life they had in front of them. And Dan and I were sort of, I don't know. I didn't feel like they were really paying attention to me. And I don't think they were, but it's not their fault. I, I knew that at the time even. So I just became this. I have to take care of myself. I'm the only one that's going to be watching me. So I became vigilant, watchful, you know, the mom, you know, <laughs> because I believed that I was the only one watching out for me. Not that they neglected me at all. It's not about that. It was just an internal thing with me. I think as I get older, I realize that I'm sure they were watching me and they were probably trying to help me. But I had made up my mind that adults couldn't be trusted. And so I just sort of went off on my own deal. Let's put it that way. So um Is that the point when, when your mom that, started is that when you is that when she started drinking? No. Uh uh. I think that that was a while later. Um she was working eight hours a day and just trying to survive. It was a little later. They had belonged to this culture of friends that were party central. I mean, they were hard drinking, jazz playing, let's go to a party people. And so when dad died, because he was the real party guy, um, I think just gradually, she never, she wasn't a drinker during the party days. But I think just mm. gradually it started. And then she remarried uh, when I was like 18. And he was a real drinker. And then that's when it really started. So I would say about nine years after my dad died. Um, did, that, did, the, did, did the alcohol, because she was like really a drinker, right? She was what would be considered an alcoholic. Been, she, yes. And I'm pretty sure my dad was and my grandfather and maybe my grandmother. I grew up in Alcoholville. It was just my life. Everyone had cocktail hour and, you know, parties where kids were just sort of in the background and the adults were hooping it up. Um, but what did you ask me? Oh, I just, I was just saying it would be considered alcoholism. What she, later on, what she got into. I mean, she was definitely, an alcoholic. Definitely, no question about it. And I'm but sure, uh, and I'm sure that I'm sure that affected you. 
Yeah. Yes. It's really anybody who grows up with an alcoholic parent knows it's, it's not, it's not good. It's very dysfunctional. She was also prescribed drugs like all the women were back then, Valium, Vicodin, whatever. So she was dealing with pills and alcohol and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. Um, and it just made me know that that's not what I wanted to do with my life. I became, you know, I think you can go two ways. You can join the party or you can become, you know, strident in your abstinence. So that's sort of where I went with it. And it was hard so, to watch because so she descended into hell. Right. Um, so this brings up a good question. What attracted you to my dad? Because my dad was a partier. <laughs> Life is so weird. It's so weird. I was always attracted to the, the bad boys. Always. Why is that? Why are women like that? I don't know. I don't know. But the thing about dad was he wasn't all bad. He was also the most optimistic, fun, uh, uh, what do I want to say? He was a doer. He, if, if we said, oh, geez, it's probably really nice at the beach today. He'd go, let's go. You know, even if we had to do homework or study for finals, he was like, let's go. And we, would you know, load up and go. I didn't have that as a kid. We didn't have a lot of fun. And so when I met dad, he was just a bundle of fun and I loved it. And then I met the family and I was like, this is heaven because they were all fun. Papa was one of the funnest people you would ever meet. He always acted. Papa being, pa Papa dad's, being my dad's dad. Yeah. Um, which we talked laughing. about, which we talked about a lot in the last episode with, or in the episode with my dad. If anybody wants to go back and listen to that, we talked a lot about his dad, the bodybuilder, the, you know, he was in the Coast yeah. Guard. He, he was like the, the most fun guy ever. He had uh, a lust for life. He was a very yes. vital person, which dad is as well. And mm -hmm. so I think that that really, um, I realized that people went and did things on weekends. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't do that much. I had a wonderful, uh, the people in my life loved me. My grandmothers were everything mm -hmm. to me. They could not have loved me more, but we weren't active and going places. I think the biggest thing I did as a kid was they took me to the Portland Zoo once and maybe a couple of weekends at a be at the beach, but we didn't travel. We didn't have recreation. And so when I met the Brinkers, they are all about recreation, you know, and it was just fun to me. I, it was like a new world opened up before mm. my very eyes. And then I met Margie and Linda and Alma and, you know, his mom. And it, I just felt like I was home. So even though dad was, you know, he wasn't a bad boy, but he definitely loved to party. <laughs> and, you know, it's always been sort of a bone of contention between us. But uh, I don't know. I wouldn't have given up the other stuff. So. Yeah. So you meet dad and I, I totally get it. That makes sense the way you're positioning it. It's like you had kind of a you know, your mom was surviving. Your dad died. It was awful yes. situation. Like all these, all this, uh, all these factors that went into the, the environment at your home. When you met dad, this, this creature of like full optimism, Yeah, you know, life, life, li life with the throttle down, smiling, yeah. laughing and, and, and his family and extended friends, the, you yes. know, the, the Schmitz and all these people who are just all yes. about fun, 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 fun. Yes. And I can, I can now see how that would be attractive, um, yes. to you. So, okay. So you guys, you guys meet and 
ultimately you're like, all right, this is, this is it. Well, dad didn't let you not say no to marrying him, right? No, he, he went home the next day and told his family at dinner that he had found the girl he was going to marry. And at that point, I probably had already forgotten about him. He was just somebody I met. <laughs> And then, and then he sent me a dozen roses with a poem. And oh my god, I was very cynical. I was like, "Ew, that's gross." <laughs> what a- do you do you have that poem somewhere? I do, I do. Um, and he wouldn't let up. He kept calling. It was like now you would say he was a stalker. <laughs> the, the good thing was he was so likable, it was hard to not respond to him. So finally, uh-huh. I went out with him, and the whole time it was like, you're going to marry me. And I was like, you are out of your mind. I meant it, too. I, I just could not believe somebody would say that. But anyway, long story short, <laughs> once I met his family at Christmas, I met him in November and I met them in December. I walked into the house and that was it. I mean, we had ups and downs after that. It wasn't like clear sailing, but that when I fell in love with his family was when I finally went, okay, this might work, maybe. But- And then then you became really- That really sealed the deal too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. The, the family friends. Um, so, and so then you became really close to Margie, dad's yes. sister. Who, yes. Um, and you guys kind of became best friends, right? We were soulmates. I mean, she was my other half. She was a couple of years younger than me. So she was still, I was 18. She was still, you know, 16 going through the whole thing <laughs> that you go through when you're 16. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't know. I just, we just became instant best friends. And um, that was how it was. That was just it. And then Luke comes along, my older brother. Yep. At some point. Yes. Uh, And you guys were living at the coast. Dad had quit Mm -hmm. being a shepherd, right? (laughs) No. And he he became a. No, he was still a shepherd. We were a shepherd when we lived in Dallas in the fall and winter and spring for the lambing. And then we would move to uh-huh. our little shack in Pacific city to fish. Okay. So he, he was, was shepherding and, and fishing for salmon in a dory boat, which is a whole nother story that I actually, we didn't go a lot into that when I talked to dad, but it's so funny to think that he was a shepherd when you guys met. So yeah. you must've really liked them because not, <laughs> you know, Well, my mom wasn't crazy about it. Let's put it that way. She, <laughs> probably, she like, probably smoking a bunch, probably smoking a bunch of dope. It was kind of the hippie movement, you know, being a shepherd. Oh, he had like, long hair, yeah. you know, and John Lennon right. glasses and, you know, <laughs> yeah. David, what do you do? Yeah, I'm a shepherd. And then I <laughs> I'm like a shepherd. I like, I like, yeah, I like for sure. Lambs, for sure. And my mom was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you always knew you wanted kids. Always, it was all I ever wanted. Actually, besides being a Broadway star, a prima ballerina, what was the other thing? Oh, and a great artist. But mm. more than that, I wanted kids. Just that was just who I was. So when Luke came along, you were on top of the world. Yes. Yes. Happiest days of my life were when all three of you were born. Couldn't have loved let's, it let, more. Let's talk about that. What was it like having th- three young kids, the good, the bad, the ugly? Like, you know, I, I, I'm always interested to know about my childhood prior to what I can remember. Well, I would say, first of all, you have to know that one of the reasons I wanted kids so bad was because I wanted to give them a really fun life. 
Do you know what I mean? Like I wanted to mm. give my children experiences that I didn't have, plus the love that mm. I did for sure have. And mm. I always said I wanted you guys to be a really good date when it came time to dating. I wanted you to have a rounded experience so that you could go out into the world and really you know, get out there and do it. Even though I was afraid, 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 I didn't want you to be that way. So when you guys were little, dad and I were a pretty good team because he wasn't afraid. And so things that would scare me, he would say, no, we're, we're going to do it. And then the rule was that I needed to look like everything was great. Yay. Whatever. So, um, I didn't count on having three boys though. I was pretty for sure that I would have at least one girl. So that was kind of a twist. I didn't know how I was going to relate. You know what I mean? To boys. Were you disappointed? Um, No, no, no. I was shocked each time one of you was born that you weren't a girl, but then that just was and gone. And ba- back then, could you not find out the sex back then, or did you just choose not to? You know, I kind of don't think so, but I don't think I would have done it anyway. I just mm. wanted to find out when you were born. Yeah, But, right. you know, we didn't have a lot of money, and I don't know. It was, we lived in a trailer um, and then lived in the shack in the summers. And, um, it was just fun, fun. And as you guys kept coming, it would just got more fun. Yeah. And so you, you stayed home. Yes. Um, and we, we grew up ultimately when I was born, that was the second one. You guys ended up building our house that you, that you still live in today yes. out in the country. Yes. Um, and I just remember I, the things I remember about you. So this is pre my like super detailed conscious memory, but like, Uh like sort of just the feeling I get from my childhood. You were, you were just, you, you didn't, you didn't work. So you stayed home with us and Mm -hmm. I just get the, the, I have the best warmest memories of how loving you were and how much we like, how much, I guess we just had, like you said, we just had fun. Like we were outside, we were making, you know, we were doing plays, we were wrestling, we were whatever, but I, you were, you guys had like, there was rules and we yeah, weren't we like s- spoiled rotten. Like there was discipline for sure. I remember getting spanked. Oh but yeah. Well, I don't remember was... spanking you. That's funny. I don't remember ever spanking you. Oh yeah. I remember the, wo- I remember a wooden spoon. Well, I'd chase sure. you around with a wooden spoon. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Maybe it never, maybe it never happened, but I do remember you threatening it. <laughs> uh, but the, there was so much love and fun. And I think, I think the combination of your neuroses, which you, you, you're, you're anxious person, just like I am. This is where I got it yeah. Yeah. with dad's overwhelming optimism created such a great environment. Cause you were never going to like send us off a cliff, you know, but it, it created this balance where, yeah, there was a balance for sure. But like we were, you know, even when you didn't have money, we were going, you know, skiing and, you know, to the beach to the lake, and to the lake, you guys yeah, we... to the lake almost every weekend to be with the family. Cause mm-hmm. Papa still had, a uh, still lived on a lake. We were boating, we were tubing, we were swimming, we were fishing. Mm-hmm. I just don't remember a lot of dull times. I don't remember. I mean, there was hard times and like, obviously like the, the normal ups and downs, but yeah. you you, especially you, cause dad was gone a lot and mm-hmm. I was lucky because dad, because of his interests and my interests aligned, which was hunting and fishing. Right. I was a, I was able to go with him a lot. It's actually, you'll like this mom this morning, this morning. So I'm getting ready to take Easton on a hunting trip to, um, to Hawaii. And, you know, I've taken him out of school already quite a bit this year to go hunting. And we got a nasty letter um oh. from oh. them and and but i grew up my dad took me out to go to work with him to go hunting with him and i cherished those memories and those that education much more than i cherished my public education sorry people but yeah. 
So I'm kind of like middle finger. I'm taking my son. This is his one childhood. I'm taking him out of school. We'll take, we'll take homework. If you yeah, have a yeah. problem with that, come talk to me. Do but um, anyways, I, I, I call, yeah, do the work. And, you know, I called the school this morning and I talked to them and it's all good. I mean, they were, they were really nice. Uh, but I guess just my perspective is, and this comes from what you guys did was, you know what? These memories and experiences are so important to shape him as a person and for him to also have, you know, it's, it's kind of a safe haven in your mind to go back to when things get really shitty too, right? Mm -hmm. Like those memories are just, and over time they become more happy, even though I bet our trips to Hawaii as a kid were super stressful for you guys. And it wasn't all butterflies and rainbows. Was stressful for me. <laughs> to keep you guys alive, but Dad was having right. a hoot, you know. So yeah, but the, I it the, was... the 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 but the thing that I remember the most about you is you listening and never getting um never getting in trouble for talking to you about anything. Um, even even to this day, I can call you and talk to you about anything yeah. and that is you couldn't put a price on that to have a mother that's willing to listen and help you solve problems but also it's just there is to be com to, to provide comfort you know um mm -hmm. it, it was really what you did in staying home all those years and taking us to school and i remember some days mom you like hitting your dashboard and like <laughs> God damn it. Life, life is, this is so hard. This is so stressful. You know, cars breaking down. We constantly had car problems, oh, yeah. money problems, all kinds of problems. Uh, you know, we, uh, you lo ended up losing Margie in a car accident, which we talked about in the last episode with my dad, which was unbelievably traumatic for you to lose your best friend. Yeah, I'm, um, devastated. I'm still not at still all. Still to this. <laughs> yeah. No. And you never will be. Yeah. But even through all that, you were the most supporting, loving, fun mother that I could have asked for. And Aww, I thank, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. But why? Why did you, why were you so good to us? Because we were shits. <laughs> no, you weren't shits. You were just little boys. That comes with the territory. Um, I just made that decision when I was a little girl, that when I had kids, I was going to be there for them. That was just because I had felt so alone. And so it was a mm. conscious decision. I mean, it, my personality probably plays into it, but I mean, I made the decision that I didn't want you guys ever to feel like you couldn't tell me anything. So, mm -hmm. um, that I mean, just... I remember calling you, I, I, I remember several scenarios where this is, I mean, this was the true test of that statement, right? Yeah. I remember one scenario where, where I got an MIP, which I don't even know if they still do this, but minor in possession of alcohol, right? Which is like yeah. at the time, a super big deal. Like, you know, you feel like you're going to jail or something, but it's, it, it, yeah. it ends up being like a nothing burger, but we got caught at a party drinking and most of the kids like were either running out the back door or, you know, whatever. I just remember like the cop coming in and I'm like, all right, whatever. I picked up the phone. I called my mom and I said, I just got an MIP and I need to go home. And you guys came and got me and I was in trouble. Like it wasn't like you didn't care, but right. I wasn't scared to call you. Um, well, actually, I wasn't, I didn't need to run away. The cop called me, woke me up. He did. I thought I called you. No, you I talked to you on the call, but the cop called me. And he oh, said, oh, 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 gotcha. Party. All the other kids ran, but David didn't. Yeah. And he told me to call you. It was like, wasn't it like one or two in the morning? I had to wake yeah. the other kids yep. up. Dad was gone, of course. I had to wake mm -hmm. the other kids up, load them in the car, and come get you. And I don't think you were super afraid. I think you just got in the car no. and we talked about it. I mean, I wasn't afraid at all. Thrilled, but. I knew you guys were I was doing embarrassed. Stuff. Mostly I was embarrassed because of a couple things. One, I was there with my two best friends at the time which were on the football team and homecoming was the next well, week. That could have been a problem. And yeah. and I, well, it was a problem. They didn't get a play. And then two, 
the, where we got the, where we had that party was at one of my teacher's house. So I had to go, I had to go to that class that next Monday <laughs> with that teacher. <laughs> and, uh, he obviously knew that we got busted. So that was a little awkward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. cause his son, his son was one of my friends and they were gone and whatever, but, yeah. no. um, the other scenario it. I remember, the other scenario I remember, and I think, I don't think you realized it at the time, maybe because you were in denial, but <laughs> I've told you about this, I think. Uh, there was one day I, I, on lunch, I went and I, I smoked pot with uh, one of my friends. Uh, and then I also ate brownies because I had never done it before. Like, he's just like, eat these brownies. I'm like, all right. And I remember I ate like a whole brownie and then I smoked <laughs> some weed or whatever. And, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting in marine biology after lunch and literally the room is spinning upside down and everybody's faces are turning into demons. And like, I am like hallucinating beyond measure. And I, I'll never forget. Um, we were supposed to be like reading along in our books. Right. And the teacher looked at me and goes, David, what do you think? <laughs> and I'm, and I looked down at my book and my book was upside down. I was literally reading it upside down. And I, and I just, I just remember closing the book and then like, all, it's all in slow motion. Like I'm seeing like 70 hands and stuff. I walked <laughs> out of the room and I told the front desk that I was sick and they called you and you came and picked me up. And I just remember climbing into the back seat of your old Volvo, that piece of shit Volvo that you had that always broke down. And I fell asleep and you took me home and you never asked me one question about it, but uh, I knew, I, you had I to knew, have known. I did. I didn't know what you'd done. I'm not saying that, but I knew right. you were screwed up. <laughs> and it wasn't. You were it was. Screwed. That was one of the first and only times I've ever been that way. And I hate it. I hate the way it makes me feel. Um, I had a later experience in life that maybe someday I'll talk about. I'm not a big, <laughs> I, I, I can't, I hate that feeling. So this is why I don't do any drugs whatsoever. But um, yeah, so, and this was before they like knew how to dose edibles too, <laughs> because I remember the brownie that I ate, the brownie that I ate had like full buds in it. Like, <laughs> I don't even know how. I don't even know how, like, I, I'm surprised I didn't have to go to the hospital or something for like, just a, like an anxiety attack. But uh, anyways, point being, you, you were always there for us, even when we were being absolute pieces of shit. <laughs> and we, especially in our high school years, you know, I drank too much. Luke drank too much. Blake had his problems. Um yeah. But through it all, you never, we, we were, we were disciplined, but you were always there for us. And even to this day, I'm 42. I can call you and, and with a concern, this just happened last week, right? Um, mm. uh, when I, when I had that melanoma scare, I was able to talk you to it and you actually, your voice makes me feel calm and I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine admitting that as a grown man, right? <laughs> Um, because I think, I, I, th I think, I think your relationship with your mom is often underrated as a man. Like you have to have a father and you have to have a mother or at least a father figure and a mother figure. And it's the combination of the two, you end up finding things that you, you, you need from both. Right. So like, there's some things I don't call you with because I need the dad. I need the optimistic, That's right. <laughs> you know, you yeah. Or there's some things I need to I need to call you with because my neuroses is so bad. You're the only one that under, dad doesn't understand it. He'll just be like, "Well, stop." Yeah, he'll be like, "Stop thinking about it. Just don't forget about it." You know, none of that's going to happen. And I'll be like, "Well, you, yeah, yeah, you don't really. Yeah, that's not the way it works, Dad. I wish I had your mind." Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. So, what were you? What were you most? proud about the way what you did with us and then what would you go back and change <laughs> if you could you know this is interesting i when you and rachel started having kids and they started needing discipline i would sit back and watch 
uh, you, but Rachel, because I was with Rachel the most. You know, I'd go to Montana and spend 10 or 20 days there. And I would watch her. I was horrible at discipline. I didn't, that wasn't fun. And so I knew that if I disciplined you, it was really disciplining me. So I didn't ground anybody. I wasn't very consistent. I think you could have used, all three of you could have used maybe a little tighter hand than I was able to give. But Rachel, I have always been so impressed by her consistency in discipline. Like there were times I'd be like secretly to myself, like, oh, he just needs a hug. And she would like carry <laughs> through, nothing bad, oh, yeah. but like she would take it from point A to D and be consistent right. with it. And I would look at her in awe because I would think I either was too lazy or incapable of doing that. I probably could have had a tighter rein on you guys. You were kind of feral. Do you know what I mean? Like you were pretty <laughs> wild. And I, right. I didn't mind it. Uh, you were just kids. You fought all the time and things got crazy and stuff like that. But I probably could have been a dis better disciplinarian. Dad only disciplined when it became way too much for me to handle. And then I think you guys ran. Not that he ever did anything, but his voice spoke to you where mine didn't really. You guys had just kind of <laughs> at me. Luke used to just turn around and laugh as I was chasing him with a wooden spoon. You know, <laughs> I don't think you were very afraid of me. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't, I, I wasn't um, a good disciplinarian. I wanted to have fun. I, was I was it. afraid of you, but I, I don't, I don't like being in trouble. No, uh, you, you never know. did like being in trouble, but you didn't get in trouble very much. Luke right. and Blake, yeah, did. not bad, but just trouble. And it's interesting you say that because Easton, my middle son, um, he's a lot like I am and we used to be yes. where if, if you get him in trouble, you got to be very careful how you dish out the bad news because <laughs> the consequences, yeah. like he just takes, he's, he's, he's a sensitive guy and he doesn't yes. like being in trouble. If he gets a whiff that he's in trouble, it ruins his entire day. He can't, yeah. whereas my daughter, Isabel, which is, was more like Luke, my older brother, yes. she'll be like, whatever, dude. Yeah. Like. <laughs> No, I actually, she'll be like, no, I disagree. That's not what I did. Um, and she'll like yeah. fight back and you'll be like, wait a second. Who's the parent here? What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Like, uh, so, and, and that's what, like, it reminds me of, she reminds me so much of Luke growing up. Yes. Like, I, 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 I feel like they're, yep. Just strong willed and, and they just you know. came out of the shoot that way. I mean, Luke was Luke from mm -hmm. day one. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Peaks Equipment, the world's leading technical hard goods and accessories brand for backcountry enthusiasts. From trekking poles to headlamps to best-in-class gators, Peaks delivers a system of products that work to achieve optimal performance in the harshest conditions. Don't suffer on your hunting adventures. Peaks enables you to thrive on the mountain when everyone else is going home. Visit peaksequipment.com and use code ALTITUDE for 10% off today. That's ALTITUDE for 10% off on peaksequipment.com. He was always stronger yeah. than me. And so that, mm -hmm. that was a challenge, but I mean, he didn't do bad things. He was just, I don't know. He was just always smarter than me and stronger than me. I guess. Well, but and that's yeah, the you, problem with, with, that's the problem with, with, with Isabel, um, is, I'll be like really busy and they'll get in a fight and I'll, and usually Isabel is the instigator, unfortunately. And I'll be like, Isabel, you know, please stop doing X. I'll like, I'll catch one snippet of it and I'll use that as the example. Stop doing this. And she'll be like, well, that's not specifically what I said. <laughs> and I, and so I, it's so frustrating. I'll be like, Isabel, I don't care what you specifically said. I, I care that you stop this behavior, you know, but she'll be like, well, it's still not specifically what I said. No, she's so smart. She's like, 
<laughs> and she's right. It's not specifically what she said. That's right. You know, uh, yep. that's what's so annoying about it. I was trying to remember there was one time she said something to me that was so intelligent and she was right. And it absolutely <laughs> like, out. Oh, well, okay, whatever. And I, I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's, it was unbelievable. Okay. So, um, now that you've seen where we end up, so your regret is you'd been more disciplinary, right? And well, it would have I helped maybe know. some I mean, consistent, not more of a disciplinarian, but maybe more consistent. Cause I'd get angry with you guys and I'd say, you know, go to your room and you know, until you can be nice, don't come out. And two seconds later, you guys had come out and I'd be okay. You know, Let's go do something. I just wasn't very consistent. Now, it may not have made a bit of difference. I don't know. I was just who I was. I couldn't do any different, mm -hmm. I guess. But right, right, no, right. I don't regret a lot of things. I wasn't a very good mom to teenagers. That was hard for me. What um, do you mean by that? Well, you guys were stepping out into the world and doing things that I didn't want you to do with mm. the drink and the you know smoking and smoking pot and whatever i didn't and and girls or you know all of that i it caused me a lot of anxiety so i would say those were hard years i did the best i could that's all i can say i hope i did all right mm. but that was hard for me well i appreciate you weathering that because Man, I can only imagine if I, if my kids do what we did, I don't know how I'll get through that. It's, well, uh, that's my point. You don't know how you're yeah, going to get through We're trying you to avoid just, that. <laughs> you can't. I'm sorry. You can't. It's just all in how you raise them and talk to them about stuff. Like you guys were out mm -hmm. doing God knows what, but you still called me every time you were mm -hmm. out. I knew kind of where you were. I mean, I'm sure that you weren't completely honest with me a lot of the time, but you always made your curfews. If you didn't, you called me. I, I was mm -hmm. in touch with you guys. You made a point mm -hmm. to go to a phone and call me. So, uh, so I feel fortunate in, cause a lot of the moms I knew didn't know where their kids were. They never called them. They just have to wait to see when they got home because we didn't have cell phones and all mm -hmm. that. But you would go to a phone right. booth if you had to and call me. I really appreciated that. You guys were good kids yeah. in that. Well, you were good kids anyway, but in that regard, you were good. Yeah, I think if I could go back and do it over again myself, I would try to avoid the drinking aspect. Uh, yeah. I think I drank too much. I think you my did. friends drank too much. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have avoided a lot of the problems that I had had I done that, we also had a lot of fun. Like I have a lot of actually fond me memories from parties with my friends too. You do, but probably a lot more, probably a lot more drama and bad stuff, right? What mostly the, the turmoil that I. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Mostly it was the turmoil that I know I put yours because now I have your nerves now, right? Yeah. So if if my kids were doing that, I know the anxiety that you must have been going. You couldn't sleep if we didn't get home. You know no. all those things, and I. And I, and I, now I know that. And I, if I could go back and change it, I would actually, I was just talking to my, one of my best friends, Aaron, mom. Yes. The other day. And we both agree. He was one of my friends with me in this whole era. Yeah. And we both agree that that that's, that's what we would change. We would, we would avoid the, the drink. If you can avoid having the drunk phase of your mm -hmm. late teens and early twenties, mm -hmm. I found that although my life, I have a very successful and happy and beautiful life my entire life was stunted because mm -hmm. of that. Meaning yeah. because of that, I didn't start college until I was like 22 or 23 right. and all the rest of my friends that avoided it, not all of them, but the ones that avoided all those hiccups, they were getting out of college at 22, 23. Therefore they got married a little bit earlier, got their career started a little bit earlier, had kids a little bit earlier. Like they're my, that five or six year window where I was pretty much just wasting time drinking a bunch and doing whatever mm -hmm. could have been a little bit more productive. I wish I would have maybe gone and done a study abroad or something and, or, or yeah, I don't know, maybe go and got, gone and got, 
guided in Alaska or something like that. That'd have been cool. I just wish I would have wouldn't have wasted so much time getting drunk. Um, and that's, but that's there's nothing a good point because there's nothing. Well, I did try to talk all of you guys out of doing all this. It didn't matter what I said. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was the culture that you were living in. Your life away from home had its own culture and its own norms. And that was what you did. So that's, it. I wanted to mention that. I wanted to mention that because there's a lot of, especially men that listen to me on this mm -hmm. podcast that are from rural areas, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. culturally, um, they can really hear that because when you grow up in the country in a rural area, at the time, the town I was going to school in had like 9,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, it's a logging town. It's, you know, Hickville. It's, you know, we're, we're country folk, right? Mm -hmm. Very conservative. But as a kid, you have a couple choices. It's not like there's a city with all these activities to go do these things. Yeah. Um, you, you have a couple choices. You can do what I did and get addicted to the outdoors. So that's healthy. That's good. Yes, that but when you get great. to the high when, when you get to the high school portion, when it's the weekend and you want to hang out with your friends mm -hmm. and this might be the same in any culture, subculture of the United States, but especially in rural communities, unfortunately it's like drinking beer on a tailgate. That's what you go do. You go start yeah. a fire somewhere or someone's parents are gone. You went in to the the house where the parents were gone that weekend. Mm -hmm. And you start a bonfire and you get a case of Coors Light and you wake up the next morning in some random sleeping bag on the, you know, with like smoke on your clothes. And you probably Bloody ended up smoking some all over the room. Yep. And that was just to your point. That was the culture. I guess I just, I didn't really take notice that there was another option, <laughs> you know, you didn't know any different. You did not know any. Yeah. Different. This is just. This is just what you did to fit in. And, and I'm not right. blaming my, I made the choices. I did those things, but right. this is, this was just the way it was. It's the and way I, it was. You know, it's like almost like the, the, a little rule version of the matrix. It's just the way it worked. It's in order to get out of it. You have to really like, be like, wait a minute, what the hell are we doing? Like, what, right. what is the point of this again? As a teenager who's, you know, drinks a lot, you don't have the uh, self-awareness to do that. It's like no, no. self-awareness. <laughs> Zero self-awareness. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but that I apologize for that phase personally. I can't Honey, speak for the other kids, but I'm sure they do too. To apologize. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm just glad you all made it out alive. That was my goal. I am too. <laughs> well, that you did a good it. job with that. <laughs> uh, so what about in, in, your, in your personal life though? Yeah. If you could go back and change a couple things, what would they be? Hmm. Oh, wow. I consider my personal life to be a mother. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, I did have... What about your personal interests? I wish yeah. that I would have pursued in a more serious way, art, because I love doing artwork. I, I, I probably could have been a better student of it, still could, not saying it can't, but I think that I would have loved that. Um, more education, like I, I, I would have loved going back to school at a certain point. I, I don't want to now, but um, just things like that, but really, my family, my best friends, that was, that was it. I, I loved it. I don't have a lot of regrets. There are things, periods that I don't like. The 90s were hell. Um, you know, I've had a lot of loss. But, you know, that's life. I've really, because dad is a hard worker, and we made a deal when we got married that I would handle the home and hearth. He, and if I, you know, provided well for him in my world, he would provide for me and you guys. So that was the deal we made, which I loved. And because he was a hard worker, I had a lot of time to pursue my interests. So I don't feel lacking in that way. You know, 
talk about my antiques and things like that. I collected antique paper for years and years and years. I have a wonderful archive of that. I've been able to pursue my interests and my antique hunts and history. And I don't feel gypped at all. I, I think it's just my own sort of uh, fatigue, life fatigue that I don't do more. But um, mm. well, you do a lot. I mean, it's actually pretty. It, it's pretty cool that we can give back to you. Um, yeah, in, in a couple you ways. You guys do well, so much. And and you know, older brother Luke has. Um, it's been so makes me so happy because of his incredibly rare life that he gets to live. You know, around the world. Uh, which I'm going to have him on. We'll tell more of that story, guys. But my my older brother Luke lives a fantastical life of sure luxury does. and <laughs> and uh, travels the world constantly. Has a worldwide business. Hard, uh, sure. you know, is co co hard worker constantly. You know, his best friends are celebrities and all the rest. Right? He lives in L A. But my mom has gotten to um he constantly and proactively takes advantage of that and brings my mom along. So she's got to go to all kinds of big movie premieres and hang out with movie oh, stars. Yeah. She's got to go to Europe with him multiple times and do all these fly on private jets and all these cool yeah. things. Plus the, he adopted a son and, you know, she's got to be the grandmother to little Louie and, you know, on, mm -hmm. on, on my side, you know, I think, the thing, one of the things that made you so happy, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but the, our first child, Isabel, ended up being the little girl that we weren't, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, That's right. when she came yeah. out, you, you you had a dream about us having a dark, or maybe it's even before I met Rachel, you had a dream of me having a dark haired little girl. Yeah, yeah. When at the time I thought I was going to marry, a, you know, like a, a hot blonde, right? <laughs> and then I met Rachel and... <laughs> and then I met Rachel and uh, I found a beautiful dark haired woman and I married her. And then we had a dark haired uh, yeah. daughter, Isabel. And I think it, you and Isabel, you and Isabel, you, you're close to my sons as well, but you and Isabel's connection that you have um, is, is so special um, yeah. with all the kids, but especially Isabel, cause she was the first yeah. and you got to spend a ton of time with her when she was really little. And even to this day, yeah. I feel like she's like one of your best little friends. She is. I hope she always is. All of you guys have done so much for me. And just you check on me. I talk to all of you every day almost. And yeah, I I couldn't ask for, for better. And funds. now, and now, and now, and now Blake, um, who I'm also going to have on, you know, getting married to yes, a beautiful, wonderful. wonderful person with, with a family that's very reminiscent of the Schmitz, uh -huh. constantly having fun, constantly having fun, and she's a wonderful wife to him, and she's a blessing to our family. So I, I, I hope my hope is is that you know we're <laughs> we're now giving back to <laughs> to uh, yeah to fill in for some of the the bullshit we, that we put you through, and totally. you know it's, it's completely even, Stephen. I'm I'm very mm -hmm. blessed to have you guys. Totally, just totally. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? Well, I'm still up for adventures. I want to travel. I, I'd like to sometime move maybe <laughs> and have a new, not a new home necessarily, but a new place or a beach mm -hmm. house. Or if all you guys migrate over to Central Oregon, maybe a cabin over there. And I'm not done moving around. I want to travel and I think travel is my biggest thing that I want to do. If I could name one thing. Um, what, but I'm up ahead. for some, go ahead. What, what advice do you have for, um, there's many men and women that listen to this that are raising young kids. What advice do you have for them? If you could offer anything that might help them, in any way as parents? Well, I think one of the most important things to lay out on day one is 
uh, physical attention, communication, making them feel safe and secure, and opening up their worlds to new things and teaching them not to be afraid as much as you can, you know, be smart, but not afraid. And I just think it's all about communicating. I really do. And establishing a deep connection in that way so that in the years that you really need it, it's there to, to pull from. You won't see the results of it for a really long time, but um, I think that's the most important thing and expose them to lots of different things and people. And um, I don't know. I think that's, I'll probably think of something else when we are done, but I think that's the most important thing and just love them to pieces no matter what. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's pretty simple actually. Well, I, I certainly appreciate everything you've done for us and I tell you, I love you every day, but I love you. I appreciate you. Love you, and, too, sweetheart. Uh, Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully we do a few of these. Um, and, you know, and people find your story uh, as interesting as I do and uh, can take something from our conversation that maybe they can kind of put in their life. And I don't know, you guys will have to determine that for yourself. But I wanted to bring you on and have a conversation. Um, while I'm at it, um, make sure you go listen to my dad's conversation, which was two or three episodes ago. Um, I'm going to have my older brother, Luke, my younger brother, Blake here soon. So follow along in these, um, also please go subscribe to our YouTube channel, the altitude show on YouTube. Follow me on Instagram, Dave Brinker underscore, um, go support our partners, please. It helps me outdoor class. You heard the ad. Hopefully you didn't skip it uh, uh, a few minutes ago. Also, uh, peaksequipment.com. Go buy yourself some gear. Use my code ALTITUDE at both those websites. Um, and, you know, continue listening. I have a new segment that I'm doing every Friday, which is going to be called Elevation Journal. It's basically me uh, verbally communicating my journal, journal every week to you guys about my own journey through life. Um, I hope you guys like it. I just put out the first one uh, yesterday. So with all that said, I appreciate you coming on, Mom. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I, can't w I can't wait to get this out to the world. Well, thank you very much. Loved it. <laughs>